Good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy Hopkins, and I coordinate the webinars for Hausman Johnson Insurance. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Cybersecurity Concepts for the C-Suite, by David Cruz and his guest, Christopher Gregg. Today's webinar will run for the full hour. If there is time after the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. If you have a question during the webinar, feel free to type it into the question feature and we will address it. After the webinar is over, there will be a short survey we are hoping you can fill out for us to give us feedback on the webinar and webinar topics you're interested in learning more about. Feel free to share your thoughts on LinkedIn or Facebook and tag Hausman Johnson. This webinar will be recorded and will be available on the webinar archive section of our website. Each attendee will also receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording and the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter for today's webinar, David Cruz. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you taking some time out of your Thursday to have a discussion with us that is becoming increasingly relevant and has been relevant for quite some time, but maybe is moving closer and closer to the top of public consciousness, we'll say here. So um, before we get um, before we get too far here, it wouldn't be an insurance webinar if we didn't have at least a little bit of a disclaimer at the front. Um, any references to coverage and claims examples are illustrations only, and in the event of any discrepancy, the language of your policy prevails. And we are not attorneys, despite the fact that we look good in suits, we are not attorneys, and this is not legal advice. So, uh, if you have legal questions, consult your legal advisor. So, and I don't look that good in a suit. <laughs> And Chris doesn't look that good in his suit. Anywho. <laughs> um, so I'm David Cruz. I'm the technology risk consultant and the cyber practice leader here at Houseman Johnson Insurance. Houseman Johnson has had a focus on technology companies um, of all stripes, biotechnology, digital health, um, Internet of Things, and, and everything in between for going on about 25 years or so. But we've had a specific focus on the area of cyber risk management and cyber insurance policy over the past five years, and I've been the leader of that practice. Um, my primary duty around the office here is to make sure that I'm keeping, keeping the pulse of how those insurance markets are developing and so we can make the right recommendation for the right client at the right time. Um, my guest today is Christopher Gerg. He is the Chief Information Security Officer and the VP of Risk Management at Gilware. He's, uh, he is a technical lead with over 15 years of information security experience. Christopher has worked as a systems administrator, network engineer, penetration tester, information security architect, VP of information technology, director and chief information security officer. So he's got, he's got some street cred is what I'm saying. Um, he, has, he has experience in the challenges of information security and cloud-based hosting, DevOps, managed security services, e-commerce, healthcare, financial, and the payment card industries. He has worked in mature information security teams and has built information security programs from scratch and led them into a maturity in a wide variety of compliance regimes. While an expert in the theoretical aspects of information security best practices, he has also experienced in the practical aspects of building secure technical environments and in working with the boardroom to promote executive understanding and support. He also authored the O'Reilly and Associates book, Managing Network Security with Snort and IDS Tools. Um, Chris is also the CEO and principal consultant with Gauntlet Consulting. Gauntlet specializes in cybersecurity risk management, information security, and compliance consulting. As a trusted advisor for his clients, including Barracuda Networks and Domino's Pizza, Chris has worked with some of the country's largest and most recognized brands to assess and bolster their information security posture. Um, Chris, what haven't I said? What else would you like to say about yourself before we get moving here? What do we know? Well, I think it's what I spend most of my time doing is just making people understand that a secure environment is an efficient environment. Uh, the information security things that you can do don't just give you information security benefits. They, they make your IT more, uh, your IT department and your IT function more efficient, uh, more able to deal with things, more agile when there's a problem, um, and actually makes problems easier to deal with. Uh, so, it, you know, taking the approach of this is a cost center isn't necessarily accurate. And also, um, taking the approach of we have these compliance obligations, let's take care of compliance stuff. If you haven't 
if you have a secure environment, you also have a compliant environment. So if you start from the, the direction of let's make a secure environment, you'll be secure by design and compliant by default. Yeah, but if you aim for compliance, you might miss security. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I always joke that there's like the uh, high on my Mac and high on my PC commercials. It's high on compliance and high on security. I, they, they're not necessarily <laughs> the same thing. Sure. Makes sense. Well, we'll get into all of that and more coming right up here. So um, because we have a combined audience here, um, Gilware was able to send this webinar out to their clients and Houseman Johnson was able to as well. I thought it wouldn't be a bad idea for us to inter introduce ourselves to each other's, um, each other's clientele here. So. Houseman Johnson Insurance is a risk management and insurance brokerage firm with offices in Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We have clients that are domiciled across the country and internationally in both the public and the private sectors. We've been around since about 1946, so we've got our 75th anniversary coming up in a year or two. And the Great Place to Work Institute and Fortune have named us to the best small workplaces nationwide best workplaces in financial services and insurance, and best workplaces for giving back. Um, those are things that we work very hard at and we're very proud of. Um, Chris, tell us a little bit about Gilware and the, the functions that you, um, you provide to your clients. Well, Gilware started in 2003, 2004, primarily as a, kind of a data recovery and a disaster recovery organization where they would help companies restore a, a server or a hard drive or an entire environment after there was an issue. Um, that grew into more of the digital forensic side of things and the incident response side of things, uh, working with a lot of insurance organizations. Uh, someone has a, a ransomware or a breach, they, they contact us and we help them figure out what happened. Um, and I think more importantly, and I think one of the differentiators is, is recover from it. How, do, how are we gonna get, get back on our feet? Um, out of that grew uh, the need for proactive information security work where the, at the end of an in, instant response, they say, well, you know, clearly we have an issue. We had a we had a problem. How can we prevent that from happening in the future? And so uh, Gilwer brought me in, and uh, not too long ago, we started a practice of this proactive information security work, helping organizations prevent the need to call the other part of our company. Um, <laughs> sure. And uh, you know, I'll say I, I, I do I do landscape photography kind of as a hobby. And I recently went on a dream trip to Scotland, and, and that's just cheating. You go around a corner, and you, there's an award-winning picture. Um, it's kind of the same thing here. Uh, because we have this incident response practice, my proactive information security work is, is pretty easy. I have, the, I have the answers to the exam before the exam happens. So we know what's happening right now, what, what kind of the threats are happening, what, what kinds of attacks are occurring right now, because we have a, a team of incident response people that are working at capacity. Uh, or near it, um, just because of the volume of the work and the, the crazy stuff that's going on. So, so we can we have a good understanding of the threats and risks that are that are hitting organizations. So, how common is that type of arrangement where you've got? And, and there's plenty of firms that do incident response, and there's plenty of firms that do risk management. How common is it to have both of those under the same roof? Um, my experience is that that's it, not every firm has that type of setup. In, in my experience, it's you're, you're kind of one or the other, and I, I haven't seen a lot of organizations that, that do both. Okay, excellent, excellent. That is a good position for all of us to be in, so we're picking your brain extensively here. <laughs> so, um, so the basic agenda that we've got here today, um, first, we're going to work through a few basic ideas that every executive should know when it comes to information security. And we just want to lay out right at the front that today, today's goal is not necessarily to have a, a technical discussion, but we're going to talk about the basics of the technical tools that management needs to know about. Um, so we're not going to tell you how to configure a firewall, we're going to, but we're going to tell you here's what it is and here's the purpose it serves and here's why it's important to your organization. Um, we'll also discuss um, how we need to adjust our understanding of information security because if we're focusing just on the technical aspects, and we're not talking about any administrative uh, aspects or physical aspects, you're missing a, a lot of the picture here. We'll, we'll lay, lay out that in just a moment. Um, next, we're gonna look at the current state of information security risk. What are the biggest cybersecurity threats the companies are facing in terms of frequency, in terms of impact, in terms of severity? And we'll also look at some of the basic mistakes that companies are making today and how, they, how those mistakes can be prevented. And after that, it's time for a little bit of self-reflection. We will work through some of the questions that executives should be asking themselves, their boards, and their teams if they want to get serious about improving their information security posture. 
And we'll, lastly, we'll talk about the holy grail, how you align your business's information security needs with your business's priority. Because when those two are pointing in the same direction, you're going to be making hay while the sun shines. So finally, we'll leave a little bit of time for some questions and answers at the end right here. So to get right into it, um, every piece of the conversation today is going to tie back into this structure in some way. Chris, explain what it is we're looking at and why it's important and how it can guide um, executives thinking um, in an information security discussion. Well, this is called the CIA triad, uh, and it's it's one of those one of those guiding principles, kind of the spine of uh, planning and organizing and thinking about information security. Because ultimately, we're we're trying to do one of three things: we're trying to protect the confidentiality of a data or service or an environment because it's information security has a physical security aspect to it. Um, we're also talking about the integrity of information. Uh, financial worlds and financial transactions, it's pretty important that the information in that data is accurate and hasn't been altered. Uh, so that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about integrity. But we can also be talking about backups for servers. Uh, if, if there's a problem with the integrity of that data, you're not going to be able to restore the, the function of those servers in an emergency. And then finally, we're talking about availability. Uh, for some organizations, uh, availability is more important. Uh, and, and that's simply that, that the machine's up and running or the service is up and running or that the, the data is available when you need it. So those three things, it's usually, it's usually a slider um, when, depending on the organization and understanding, and we'll get to that in a bit, but understanding the business uh, is vital to understanding which of these three things are most important to your organization, and that'll help help guide your strategy and your planning. Sure, and th that almost answers the next question that I was going to have. Is do you, in your experience, have you found you, have you found businesses maybe focus more on one and maybe not the other two? I, I know in my own in my own practice, I see a lot of people talking about, oh, we've, we've got backups, and we back up to the cloud and all that, and that really maybe hits at the availability piece because you can go to backups if there's something wrong. But that doesn't necessarily address pillars two and three, the integrity and the confidentiality. Do you see people overemphasizing maybe one corner of this to the detriment of the other two? Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it's because it's because of what they see. Um, uh, I, I joke around that there's an MBM degree, Management by Magazine, and <laughs> and some of these companies do a really good job of marketing, and and so you've got good backups, you've got you've got good firewalls in place. But because that's what's advertised in whatever right, website right. you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. But but a lot of times, uh, one of the one of the biggest threats, and we'll talk about that later, is, is a thing called wire transfer fraud, where where if you're making a payment, someone will change the account number or something like that, and and that's integrity. And uh, if if you're if you're not aware of all three of these things, one might be more important than, to your organization than the other, but all three are important. Um, and I, I I think that that's pretty common. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is, like I said, this is a good thing for all of us to keep in mind as we move forward through the next couple of phases of this discussion, because when we talk about different sort of concrete actions that a business can take, different controls that can be put into place to make sure that your security posture is good and getting better, each one of those controls is going to support one area of this triad. And when you're talking to somebody who's offering an information security solution to you, you should feel confident in asking, what am I getting from this? Am I getting better guarantees availability? Am I getting better data integrity? Or is my is my private data going to be more secure and uh, more confidential as a result of whatever tool you're offering? And um, if they can't answer that, then that's that should tell you something as well. Um, so let's talk about just a couple basic things that everybody needs to have some idea about. Um, Chris, what's a firewall? Well, that's a good question, Dave. <laughs> I've got um, a picture of one here, so I know Cisco makes one. Yeah, Cisco does. Uh, essentially, a firewall is is a, a, a border guard. Um, you, you put a firewall between two networks, uh, whether that's the public internet and your internal network, um, which I often call the soft, chewy center of your company. Um, you, it's the, so it's the hard candy shell around the soft, chewy center <laughs> of your company. And, and what it does is it allows certain traffic in and out of your organization. Um, and I think that's, that, that in and out part is an important aspect. A lot of people just think of it as a way to keep bad people out and only allow certain things in. The firewalls also can control what goes out of your organization largely. So you can, you can control that 
this system can't talk to the outside. Or in an emergency, a lot of these firewalls, like we have a, let's say we have a, a virus infection in our organization. Um, if you've got a tightly integrated environment, your antivirus can alert your firewall and say, we have an infected host, don't let it talk to the outside. Um, so essentially a firewall is a border guard and it allows certain things in and out of your organization and certain types of traffic, certain types of data, certain services. Um, and sometimes these firewalls give you a false sense of security. Um, if you're, if, let's say you have a developer in your organization, they're, they're writing a new application and they can't get it to work. So they open up a port from the firewall to allow traffic through it. If, if you don't have a backstop there to make sure that you close that port, that can be an avenue into your environment. So um, the firewall isn't just to throw a dust cloth on it and forget about it, but it is an important aspect to your security. But really all it is is a network device that controls traffic. Sure. Um, I've heard of software firewalls versus hardware firewalls. Are those different products or talk to me about the distinction between them. Well, the, the line is blurry. Um, I've got gray in my beard, so I remember the day where it was just the hardware firewall. and, and Which is, is that, that's right. what we're looking at here. And, and you would have two plugs in it. Um, a lot of times today, the, the firewall can be running just like any virtual host in your organization and talk to your network infrastructure, which largely isn't necessarily port-based. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a blurry line. Um, but I think if you have in your head, regardless of how it how it's either virtualized or a physical device, um, it's still doing the same sort of thing. You can you can run like there's Windows firewall on your Windows computer, like your desktop computer, uh, and that's doing essentially the same thing. It's only allowing certain traffic in and out of your host, um, and that's not a bad idea to have. If every computer has this little firewall with its rules of how it should be communicating with the outside world. Then you've got what a concept that I don't know that we're going to cover it, but it's called defense in depth. We have we have we have a moat and we have a wall and we have a tower and we've got archers on you've top. You've got archers on top of it with and then crossbows with people patrolling inside. So it's a good idea that if there's a failure of one of your lines of defense, that another one's going to pick it up. Um, and sometimes you're you're making it really annoying to be attacked, uh, <laughs> and sometimes you're making it slow enough when you're being attacked that you'll notice. Sure. So, so firewalls can be all over the place. They're not just at your border. Okay. Um, you had mentioned just a second ago that antivirus can communicate with the firewall and say, hey, there's something going on here, which leads us right to number two, antivirus. Talk to us about that. Well, in the olden days, and I'm talking, you know, probably months ago, the uh, <laughs> antivirus was was a signature-based thing. It had a big list of these are the kinds of files, whether it's a, it's a file name or the content of the file, and it's a bad thing. And anytime there was a, a file write or a read or a transfer between hosts, it would look at that file and say, go through the big list and say, does this match anything? And if it does, it's a virus and we should spin the red light. Yeah. Um, these days, viruses and virus writers uh, and malware writers. Um, more often I talk about anti-malware than I talk about antivirus because there's adware, there's there's worms, there's trojans, there's all sorts of just terrible, horrible things sure. um, that, that do a really good job of hiding themselves and making it so that they don't trigger one of those things in the big list. Uh, and so, so it's still good to have this traditional antivirus for the signatures, but uh, there's a whole other kind of breed of anti-malware solution that you should be running alongside it. Uh, and there's a number of vendors, and, and I'm not getting paid by any specific one, but uh, Sophos has a, has a tool called X-Intercept with EDR, uh, Carbon Black. Um, there, there's, there's several solutions out there that, that are more behavior-based, where they watch what your computer's doing. And if there's a file that wants to talk to the kernel, or there's a file that that wants to do something naughty, it'll notice that this file shouldn't be trying to do this naughty thing and will block it and trigger it as a, as a, a, a negative thing, maybe a potential malware. Um, and those tools together really do a good job of, of preventing things. Now, the, the problem is that this behavior-based stuff will trigger alerts more often uh, that, that are actually things that are supposed to happen. So there is a kind of a tuning that needs to happen um, in the long time ago months, um, that was that was onerous and was quite a problem. But they've gotten sophisticated enough that 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 we've seen uh, not a problem, uh, and that the, the false positives are are almost not there. So, antivirus, uh, I think it's 
it really what you're preventing is is you know someone clicks on something and something bad happens or uh, people aren't putting floppy disks in their computers anymore and spreading viruses around but sure. um, it, it's it's keeping malware from doing naughty things in your environment okay um, perfect. Um, you just talked about clicking on something that you shouldn't, which leads us to spam filters. Uh, that's something that I, I'm guessing of all of all the things we might talk about here, us normal people, us non-technical folks, we've probably heard of antivirus, we've probably heard of spam filters. The other ones, potentially not. Uh, but give us, you know, give us your your idea of the spam filter. Here. Well, these have gone through an evolution too. Yeah. They're, they're way more sophisticated than they used to be. Um, it used to be that people were trying to sell you, you know, fake Viagra and, and other things through uh, through unsolicited emails. Yeah. Um, and that's where the the spam came from, the word spam. Um, but the it's become a, a primary mechanism for delivering malware, whether it's ransomware or it's some kind of, of interception thing that's going to do something bad in your environment. Um, and, and sometimes that's very targeted, sometimes that's not. When it's targeted, it's called phishing, um, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. Uh, and it's a kind of a flavor of spam. It's very targeted spam that contains malware in the email of some sort or is trying to trick you into doing something. Um, so what the spam filter is, is it, it, it is a gateway. Uh, it's kind of like a firewall for your email. All of your email goes through this spam filter and, again, triggers, uh, whether it's a signature-based or it's kind of a behavior-based aspect to it, that, that this is bad, I'm going to block it. Um, the interesting thing is, depending on the day, between 65 and 95% of all of the email going through the Internet is spam. It's garbage. And so the spam filters, yeah, it, billions and billions, like an appreciable percentage of all the traffic on the internet is this garbage. And the spam filters do a pretty good job these days of blocking that, but they can't block it all. And some of it's going to get through. Um, but a spam filter is really just that that email filter that tries to, to filter out the bad stuff. Sure. Makes sense. Um, let's move on to a couple that maybe are slightly more, slightly more technical in nature here. Um, my order is a little out there, but we've got penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, and two-factor authentication here. Um, talk to us about those first two, I'm guessing, are related in in some way here, but talk to us about those three, Chris. All right. Well, what they offer. The penetration test and vulnerability scan actually are tightly uh, uh, bound yeah. and, and very similar. Um, essentially, so so I'll, let's clear up a misconception. Um, people, we, we come in and we say, hey, you know, we do this assessment service and, and kind of the CISO as a service sort of thing where we come in and help you build, either build an information security program or be kind of a, an outsourced information security program for your organization. And they say, well, we're going to do a pen test. We're fine. Um, well, a penetration test is really just a point in time test of the controls that you have in place. So, so the way this is, is, is related is a penetration test an external penetration test starts with a vulnerability scan. And what they do is they just scan across all of the, the, the computers and services that you're exposing to the outside public internet. And it'll go through each one of them, enumerate all the services that you're providing, um, find out what version you're running to see if you're updated with, up to date with patches, uh, and, and essentially come up with an inventory of this is all the stuff you're exposing to the public internet and then give you some recommendation that uh, it looks like this needs a patch. It looks like uh, this port is particularly uh, is running a service that's known to have vulnerabilities and exploits. You should do something about it. What a penetration test is taking is is taking that vulnerability scan and and taking the next step where a person or or a script actually tries to break in. It actually tries to take advantage of, of what may be a potential vulnerability to see if it really is. Um, but the, the purpose of all of that is to make sure that, that the configuration that you think you've got running and the services that you think you've exposed to the Internet are actually the ones that are. So like we talked about the example of a developer opening a port near a firewall to try to test something. Uh, a vulnerability scan or a pen test will, will notice that open port and we'll, we'll alert you to it. And then you can look at that and say, oh, wow, um, we should close that because we didn't think that was open. We thought we closed it and we didn't. Um, so so it, it's a valuable thing, but it doesn't stand in place of, of an information security program. In fact, what it's testing is that your information security program is working like you think it is. 
Sure. Um, and it, it, it's really an audit step. It's auditing. It's auditing the the doors and windows uh, to your your computer world, uh, and 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 letting you know what's open and what's closed. Sure. Okay. Uh, and then two-factor authentication. Uh, if if you've used a, an online banking app, uh, a lot of times they'll say, okay, what's your username and password, and then it will send you a text, or it will. Uh, maybe it has a particular app you're running on your smartphone that will generate a code, and you type that code in, and then it lets you in. It's that code that's that second factor. Um, if you've got a a modern or recent iPhone where it's either got the Touch ID where you use your thumbprint, a biometric measure, or it's got the Face ID where it looks at your face and measures the geometry of your face, that's a second factor authentication as well. So all it is 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 either a thing you you have uh, a code that you're generating uh, it's it's another step beyond the username and password to authenticate you um, there is an interesting thing here that the national institute of standards and technology this is the, the u.s government's agency that says um, what what is acceptable and what's not in terms of information security in the u.s uh, says that uh, a text SMS text or an email is not an acceptable form of a second factor of authentication. The reason for that is, is, is it's fairly, fairly trivial, at least for a nerd, to compromise your text or compromise your email. And so they, they trust that less for high security environments. No problem. But it's better than nothing. Yeah. Um, usernames and passwords by themselves are, are not a great way to say you are who you say you are. Um, and the second factor is better. I, I prefer having uh, either the biometric thing or, or a thing that generates a code, and we use that at, at Fieldware ourselves when we're authenticating. Okay, perfect. So I think um, as we move through the discussion, these are just some good things to keep in mind as we'll likely revisit some of them. Um, but like we talked about, not every aspect of your security is a technical aspect. Some are more administrative and discussion-based um, controls here. So. The first one we'll talk about is an information security risk assessment. Um, talk to us about that, Chris, and maybe talk about how that works with, you know, a, a large company like a Domino's you work with and how that works with maybe a small office that has 12 employees. You know, it, it's going to be different in scale, but not as, neither one gets a free pass. Really. Right. And it's essentially what, what a risk assessment is, and it's usually separate from a, an information security maturity assessment. Usually it's separate. But those things are related. Um, if you ultimately need to make a decision, it's useful to know what, you're, what you've got in place. So let's do an inventory. But it's also useful to know what are the threats and risks to my organization. Um, when you're reading information security stuff, they're always talking about a, a risk-based decision model. You need to know who's trying to attack you, who's trying to cause you trouble. That might be someone inside your organization, or it might be someone outside your organization. It's also useful to know what's going on in the world right now. What are the what are the what are the kinds of things that are being attacked? What are the what are the systems with the most vulnerabilities right now? So this risk assessment uh, is a multi-phase thing. It it looks at what are called threat actors. Who are the people or who are the things that are trying to cause me trouble? Whether that's a government agency or that's someone just trying to steal your money or trick you into giving it to them. Yeah. Um, and then what are what are the, the risk factors for my organization? What, what are the, the aspects of my business and my technical world, the services and data that I handle? Um, how does that expose me to these threat actors? And so this risk assessment is really modeling the threats and risks to your organization so that when you are evaluating the information security maturity of your organization, you've got some context. So what should I focus on first? What should I what should I be spending my money on, uh, and, and or what should I be spending my time, which is money? Yeah. Um, what should I be spending my time fixing first? And uh, that's that's a thing I think my organization does a little differently. Again, I have that that added education of the incident response side of things, but our 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 assessment, the beginning of our engagement with a customer, starts with that threat and risk analysis, and then we do only after that do we do an information security maturity assessment to determine what are the things that are high risk to my organization and what are the things that I'm not doing particularly well? What are my low maturity areas? And, and those percolate to the top and, and help us build a roadmap for remediation. Sure. Um, 
roadmap, I think, leads us right into this next one about a security framework. Um, my understanding of these is that a, a framework really gives you gives you sort of a skeleton upon which you can you know add in different pieces to move yourself from one area of uh, one security posture to a better one. Is that a good understanding, or is there something that we need to rework? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion around the security framework because there's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, some of the ones that 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 the listeners might have heard of are, are NIST. We talked about the National Institute of Standards and Technology. There's a there's NIST standards. There's ISO standards. You know, you see the ISO 9001 uh, for a, a factory or a manufacturing organization. There's an ISO 27001 that has to do with information security. And, and in the EU and the rest of the world, frankly, they use that ISO 27001 as a framework. Um, there's also uh, high trust you may have heard of, the CISCSC, there's COVID, ITIL, I mean, it's just this alphabet soup. Um, but really, ultimately, what they are is a big list of things you ought to be doing. And it's, it's a list of practices. It, it talks about you should be running an antivirus on all of your workstations. You should be authenticating your users in a robust way. If you've got sensitive data, you should classify that data and secure it appropriately. Um, you should do you should log events in your environment and alert on them when there's a problem. So it's, it's a list of things you ought to be doing. Um, and the way you ought to be doing them varies from organization to organization, which is a throwback to the risk assessment. Um, if you've got that risk assessment, you can make a risk-based decision on, on how you want to implement these things. So these security frameworks really are just a list of things you ought to be doing. And, and which one should you use is based on on your business. If, if you're doing work primarily in the US and maybe you're working with government agencies or you're a healthcare organization and you have HIPAA compliance thing, HIPAA is based on NIST. So you should be using NIST so when the auditor comes in, you're speaking the same language. Um, if, if you're not sure or you're, you've got multiple compliance obligations, my advice is to pick one that maps easily to the others because there are, and you can download them on the internet, there's mappings of, of one to another. So if I've got my list of NIST controls, I can map them to ISO, or I can map them to High Trust, or I can map them to GDPR or whatever else. Um, two of the ones that do a really good job are High Trust and CISCSC. Um, I use the CISCSC when I'm doing my assessments, at least the first time through, um, because it maps so easily to the others. So all a security framework is, uh, is is a list of things you ought to be doing. Sure, makes sense. Uh, so in terms of things that you ought to be doing, one of the things that we've had a lot of success with with our clients is running tabletop exercises. And this this really, in my understanding, is that when we've run them in the past, is really allowing your client to sort of walk through what a security incident actually feels like and, and test, okay, does my incident response plan work? Does the framework we put together, is, is it actually as sturdy as we think it is? Um, talk to me about your experience table topping um, incident, incidents with clients and what you've learned from that. Well, a lot of people, so one of the things you ought to be doing in the list, of, in the framework, is that you need to be testing uh, your plans. Uh, you have a plan that if there's a problem, what am I going to do? Um, and taking it to another level, there's a disaster plan, a disaster recovery and business continuity plan that you really should have. Um, but a lot of people don't test them because they think they need to turn a bunch of computers off or, or unplug the internet or, or you know, move everyone outside the building uh, to, to test it physically and in the real world. There's actually a real value in doing these tabletop exercises. And what you're doing is essentially playing Dungeons and Dragons for the nerds in the audience. Um, your, your dungeon master sits down <laughs> and, and says, okay, um, we've lost key personnel, or we've lost this building, or um, you know, all of our stuff is running in the Amazon cloud. All of a sudden, the Amazon cloud's not available. So, or, or there's been a comet strike in Milwaukee. Um, what are we going to do? And so you sit down with your your team of people, and you you just talk through what what the situation is. Most of these plans rely on communication. How am I going to communicate to my customers, my vendors, and my employees? that there's, a, there's an issue going on and we need to do something about it. And, and even maybe more importantly, who's on the hook to do that communication? So you can work through all of those things. And the, and the place where a lot of these things break down is, is who's on the hook and how are they gonna communicate? And you can, you can test all of that. 
Um, there's a military aphorism that says a plan's not a plan unless it's tested. Um, and, and these tabletop exercises go a long way, let's say 80, 90% of the way, to, to performing the test you need to to know what's going to happen. Um, I like to throw a wrench in the works when I'm running one of these tabletop exercises that that the person who's written on a piece of paper to be on the hook for communication, I point at them and say, you're not allowed to talk. You're not here. You are, you're, in, you're in the Bahamas right now having a lovely vacation with a Mai Tai sitting in your lap, and, and you're not here. And then, and then that's, when, that's when the magic happens, because then you've got to scramble and figure out who's going to do what. But these, these tabletop exercises stand in place of actually going and pulling the plug on the Internet at your company, um, but, but go a long way towards testing your plan. Yeah. Um, because uh, I've had very few of these, these, these tabletop exercises actually be successful. And that's not a failure. That's, that's learning. And, and uh, any, any kind of test that goes perfectly, you don't learn anything from. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there's real value in that. Hey, well, any, anytime, the, anytime the test sort of crashes and burns, you found out where the weak point was in your plan. And right. You can adjust it. So you almost... To a degree, you'd almost want to run them to the point where you're finding some hiccups and some spots because that's those are the, the bolts you need to tighten up. Yeah, yeah. You want to run them to that bleeding edge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we talked a little bit about this, so we maybe don't need to spend too much time on incident response planning. But if, if, in a sentence or two, what is, I guess, what's the, what should be the core goal of somebody when they're putting together an incident response plan? What, what target should they be aiming for? Well, I think people. People get all wrapped around the axle when they're trying to put one of these plans together, um, and and they it's an overwrought process that takes six months and it never finishes. Ultimately, what you're trying to do, whether it's an incident or or a disaster, and all a disaster is is a is a big enough incident that gets the red light spinning. Um, an, an incident can be a server's down. An incident can be a service has has crashed. Um, an incident can be we have a virus infection. Ultimately, you're, you're, you've, you've lost a facility or, or access to a facility. You've lost a service of some sort, whether that's power or the Internet or, or email, um, or you've lost key personnel. Um, ultimately, it's one of those three things. And uh, if, you, if your plan is that sort of thing, um, you should have the contingencies in place. And again, it, it, often it's communication. We need to get the right people here to fix it. Um, so my advice when, when doing these incident response plans is keep it simple. Um, but also, uh, I like the concept of a playbook where you can look at what are the most, get together in a room and have a workshop and say, what are the most likely problems we're going to have, whether it's antivirus or a, a malware incident or, or uh, uh, a failure of a particular service, and let's, make, let's plan specific responses for that kind of thing. Um, sometimes that contingency planning can lead to some clever scripts that can automatically respond. If email's down, let's run this script to bring the server down and bring it back and see if that fixes it. And that way, if it happens at 3 in the morning, we don't have to call somebody. Yeah. Um, but but the, I think that the bottom line is when doing incident response planning, keep it simple because I'm stupid. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Let's talk a little bit about employee awareness training because that, that leads into the tabletop discussion. It should be part of the framework as well. Um, but this is one of those one of those things that companies can be doing that's not a technical approach, but can be very effective when it comes to um, preventing and identifying an incident. What are some of the best practices you've seen companies employ when it comes to training their their key employees? Well, I I think it's it's not just a component. Some would argue it might be one of the most important components because I can have a very robust information security program. It's got very good firewalls. It's got very good anti-malware. Uh, we limit how people can get around the environment. But if if someone sends them an email with an attachment that's got malware on it and they double click on it, everything's out the window, uh, or at least to the extent that that it can cause problems. So. So awareness training is, is pretty important. Um, if I've got all the greatest controls in place and an email comes in that says, uh, oh, yeah, um, I'm the CEO, and we've got that big deal coming up, and it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a, on a Friday, we need to send $10,000 to this account or we're going to lose the big deal, and someone does it, I can have all the anti-malware in place. I've still lost $10,000. 
Yeah. So uh, that awareness training is is very important, and an awareness not just of of kind of well, this is a bad thing to do, but awareness of of what are my policies and procedures in my organization is is very important. So so what makes it what makes this valuable is is firstly things need to be engaging. Um, there's a lot of of solutions out there that can do information security awareness training. Uh, we work with several vendors that I think do some really clever things. There's some anime style uh, information security awareness training that's pretty focused. Instead of a two hour uh, new hire training, it's 15 minutes and it hits the high points. And then part of that training then moves into, here's where to find my information security policies. Here's where to find my information security standards and procedures. Um, having them well written and easy to navigate is, is all part of this awareness training. It's not just attending the, the training and, and taking the quiz. It's having something be engaging. It's having something that, that increases your awareness. You take the training and, and for the next hour, you're really thinking about information security and you're pretty aware of it. But after that hour, it kind of starts to fade. So, so having it kind of be in your face, having a little pop up when you log in, having a, the occasional newsletter that's engaging come from your information security team uh, out to the organization saying, hey, don't forget, be aware, don't click on stuff. Um, it, it needs to be kind of a constant program and part of your, your culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are going to skip this next one here. It's a, it's a perfectly good topic, but we will come back to that in a little bit here. I'm keeping an eye on our time. Um, one thing that I know that a lot of the um, a lot of the businesses that were that are attending here today, they're 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 curious about what what actual threats are businesses facing out there. And I think a, a lot of the reason this question exists is that if if it's not a you know top of the fold front page news breach like a Target or a Home Depot or a Anthem or something like that, a, a lot of information security incidents don't necessarily make it to the public sphere. Uh, and there's a whole host of reasons you know why that is. Uh, but what are you, based on your position where you can actually see the incident responders, what are you seeing businesses in Dane County and Wisconsin and across the country actually dealing with? I think that the two biggest things right now are ransomware and uh, wire transfer fraud. So let's hit ransomware first. Yeah. Ransomware is just a kind of malware. And what it does is it starts to encrypt all the files on your computers, most of the files on your computers, the important files on your computers. <laughs> Um, and your backups and all that kind of thing. And the, the, so because they're encrypted, they're inaccessible unless you have uh, the password uh, or the key to unlock it, the decryption key. Uh, and what, what happens is, is computers have gotten pretty powerful. And it used to be that if I were to encrypt an entire hard drive, it's gonna take a few days. Um, now I can encrypt all the files on a hard drive in, a, in a, an hour or so. And uh, which is terrifying because overnight, if I get if I have this this ransomware in my environment, um, it can sit for a while and wait until eight o'clock at night and start to kick off. And overnight, it can encrypt everything. And then what happens is I can't do anything on any of my computers in my environment. And not so long ago, uh, IT was primarily email and maybe a database here or there. Now. If most organizations, if they can't use any of their computers, they're not doing business because their accounting is on there, their HR is on there, their operations is on, is on there. That's it, we've moved so much of what we do to a network connected environment that it's it, if you can't access that, you're you're in a rough spot. Right, and even factories, like you think, oh yeah, I got to pull this lever. Well, that lever now is being pulled by some industrial control computer that's sitting there. And if, if all of those computers are infected with ransomware and not working, you, you really ground to a halt. And so what happens is um, someone gets infected with this ransomware and they, they then need to either restore all of their computers from a backup, um, or if those backups are also uh, encrypted with this ransomware and you can't restore from backup, you either need to rebuild all the computers in their environment, which is going to take weeks, months, um, or they have to pay the ransom. And the ransoms used to be, you know, a few hundred dollars. Now the ransoms, we've seen $1.4 million ransoms. Um, and and the, the really sad thing, and but a, a fact is, a lot of times this ransomware uh, gets, gets put on the machines after they've been in your environment for a period of time. And so... We've even seen some that 
that have gone through and they know what your your cybersecurity insurance policy is going to cover. Let's say your policy says you ransomware, uh, you're covered for fifty thousand dollars. Guess how? Guess what the ransom is going to be? It's going to be fifty thousand dollars. And and these organizations have these ransomware organizations, and I say organizations because it's become an industry. Um, our, our incident response folks have talked to these ransomers trying to negotiate a ransom with them. And they say, well, I'll take this to my supervisor. They've got help desks. They've got websites that you access through the dark web with, with chat windows that pop up. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's a complete industry. One of, the, one of the leading ones is this one called Gandcrap. And they just recently announced on a, on a forum that they're gonna get out of the business because over the course of the last few years, they've made $2 billion in paid ransoms. And they've got $150 million in their pockets. And frankly, they don't need to do it anymore. So they're going to get out of the business. They're going to go to the Bahamas and drink a Mai Tai. Absolutely, they are sitting next to your your CFO, <laughs> and uh, it, it's terrifying. Um, and it's gotten to the point that we've gotten calls from some of the insurance companies we've dealt with that they we've just called the insurance company says we've just called seven other incident response firms and they're at capacity. Can you please take our case? Um, so ransomware is is huge. And now the way they get into ransomware very often is email. Um, so we're we were talking about spam filters earlier and these phishing attempts, um, and and the importance of of awareness training. It's become vital. Um, if you get this ransomware, very often it's delivered through email. Um, it's also sometimes delivered through uh, a weakness in your in your systems, whether an unpatched system. So my incident response people would throw things at me at the office if I didn't mention that right now there's a, a Windows service for remote desktop access called uh, Remote Desktop Protocol, Windows RDP. And uh, that Windows RDP is very useful. I can I, I log into it and it looks like I have the desktop sitting on my desk or on my server. Um, there's a new newly discovered vulnerability in Windows RDP that makes it trivial to completely take over a system. And a lot of people expose RDP to the public internet to make it easier for remote access. If, if our listeners uh, talk to their IT folks at all, Tell them to turn off RDP. Um, yeah. RDP. Write, write that down. Yeah. Turn off RDP. Uh, Your IT guys will know what that means. It's 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 become virulent. Uh, and and I don't know if you remember the wanna cry uh, worm. This is going to be worse than that. Um, RDP is a real problem right now. So then the other thing that we're seeing is is wire fraud, wire transfer fraud, and that's a broad category. And this is one that's a, a little bit of a softer attack, and again goes back to that awareness training. Um, all a wire transfer fraud is is a, a one-off financial transaction that's that's tricking someone into sending money where it shouldn't be, um, or stealing money outright. Um, the this can this can take the the case. Let's say let's say we're a, a construction company and uh, we need to buy some bulldozers from an offshore company. And uh, someone has broken into our systems and is watching our email, and they see that this transaction is going to take place. And they see the email go out, say, yep, uh, $1.2 million, we're going to buy 10, I, I don't know what a bulldozer costs, but we're going to buy 10 bulldozers. And uh, that email goes out with the, with the account information. Well, another email comes in saying, hey, thanks for that email about the, the bulldozer transaction, um, but I gave you the wrong account number. Please use this, this account number instead. And the person, the, the financial person says, oh, okay, and they type in the different account number. Well, well, that account number is wrong, and, and that $1.2 million goes to the wrong account, and they don't notice for 30 days. And by the way, this actually happened. They don't notice for 30 days when that supplier says, hey, you were going to make that payment. We never saw it, and by then the money's gone. Uh, it can also be just a straight-up credit card transaction, too. Um, Ultimately, they're tricking someone into sending money where it oughtn't to go, but, but we see it a lot. And so the, the two biggest things right now are ransomware through a variety of things, most often email, um, or uh, an unpatched system, or, or wire transfer fraud. Again, coming through email very often. So can you give us an idea of, you know, say using ransomware as an example here, how, how many calls do you get in a week or a month um, from either from from anybody saying, "Hey, I have a I have a client with ransomware on their systems," or "I have I am a client and I have ransomware on my systems." How many how many requests for assistance are you getting on a weekly basis or a monthly basis for assistance in dealing with ransomware? 
Well, it obviously depends. Sure. Um, now we're seeing a spike in it because of that RDP issue I talked about. Um, but easily dozens a week. Um, uh, most of them from insurance carriers, actually, yeah. who or, or people with cybersecurity insurance, and we, we get to them through their insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because um, we're on some insurance panels. Um, but dozens. Like, it, it's it's... It's not it's well, not a small amount. Well, and, and that's that just leads us right back to the, the only security incidences that the public ever really hears about are those the big ones that make the news. And none of these, unless it's a truly nasty case, most of these aren't likely to ever make the news. But you're saying you're getting 24, 36, dozens of these calls a week, and that's that's something that I, I I'm, I'm glad this piece of the conversation came up because that's one of the things that in the insurance side that we see all the time. You know, we we see business as an aggregate. We, we insure thousands of businesses around. So we see this happening all the time too, but it may not happen to any one organization, but it could happen to any one organization. So that's, I, I'm glad that, well, I guess I'm not glad that, <laughs> I'm not glad you're seeing that by any stretch, but um, I'm glad that we're all becoming more and more aware of it. Well, and there's, there's an aspect to this um, that's interesting. And I had a talk actually with one of the, one of the legislators who's behind HIPAA and not legislators, but bureaucrats, uh, yeah. who's, who's enforcing the, the fines from HIPAA. And we, we had a really interesting and engaging conversation about the fines. Um, if, if I report a breach, I get fined. Um, that, that goes counter to what we want. We want to know about the breaches so that we can protect that data. But if you're going to fine a company $3.2 million, they're not going to be eager to report. They're incented not to. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's a real problem with current legislation. Uh, there's there's a, a legislation that's actually come through the insurance organization, it's uh, the insurance world that that has become law in New York, has become law in I think it's South Carolina and Ohio. And uh, I just had a conversation with Mark Pablo, who's the, the commissioner of insurance for the state of Wisconsin, um, about this model law. And the model law says you have to have an information security program. You need to have two-factor authentication in place. You need to have a robust firewall that the rules get reviewed on a periodic basis. So uh, a very small but robust list of things you ought to be doing. And if you're doing those things and you kind of get your rubber stamp of, yes, they're doing these things, then you don't get fined if there's a problem. Because like I said, even a, a robust organization with a good information security program in place can still have a problem. Um, and it's not the fault of the program, it's the fault of maybe the people sitting at the desk or the sophistication of the attack. Um, so so th that incense organizations is a good incentive to an organization to report a breach. Um, and so so there's kind of a bigger picture happening. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so we are coming up close to time here, but I wanna make sure that we hit on a, a couple of pieces yet that um, are gonna be important here. Um, the, the good news is, folks, we're going to um, uh, we've got three additional webinars with Gilware that we're going to be doing in the coming weeks and months here. So, if, if there's something that wasn't covered today, we will have ample time to we'll have ample opportunity to discuss that in the future here. So, sorry, I talked so much. <laughs> no, that's, there's a lot to talk about. That's okay. Um, so, we're going to jump to um, jump a little further into the presentation right here. Um, so this is this is one that I when I've talked with different businesses, it's you know am I spending enough time? Am I spending enough money? Or you know, or maybe not enough isn't the right word. Am I spending appropriately on security tools and controls? How do you begin to guide a client through that? Because obviously that figure is going to look different for that 12 person office versus the 500 employee manufacturer. Um, it, it, how do how do you begin that discussion? Well, the interesting thing is is very often when we, we have this relationship with customers, and we don't just do an assessment and drop it off on your desk and walk away. What we do is, is we essentially become a, a, an important part of your information security program uh, or, or predominantly your information security program. And, it, and it's not just a person or a department is your information security program, it's your entire information technology organization and everyone sitting at their desk is part of the program. Um, but what we find is that organizations are actually spending enough they're, they're, they've got the tools in place. Um, I think the best example is is the Microsoft world. A lot of companies have Office 365 and Exchange in the cloud. Um, and part of their, their E3 license or their E5 license and the Microsoft licensing, please don't get me started. If there's anyone from Microsoft, I apologize. 
Um, but, but the licensing is confusing. Uh, very often you're paying for what you need. Um, they have an interesting tool called the Secure Score that you log into your, your management account and go to Secure Score, and it'll tell you these are the things you ought to be doing to improve your score, improve your posture. Um, we've found that most organizations, and when I say most, pretty much all of them, um, are, have the tools they need. It's just a matter of having the guidance to use them appropriately, either, either to do the things they need to be doing or to do it in an automated way so they don't have to worry about it. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is, is if you need to spend money, very often you need to spend it in, in the headcount for your IT. Because ultimately, you have things you ought to be doing, but you need people to be doing it. Um, there's a lot of resources out on the internet from, from HR organizations that say, what's an appropriate headcount for the complexity of my organization uh, and for the, the kind of work we do? Um, and that's a good that's a good starting point. And and there isn't an organization we work with that that I would say, and, and the IT folks are gonna raise the flag too, that they, they they've got enough of head enough headcount to sufficiently address their information security program. And that's I I've I've read different different statistics recently talking about just the, the gap of the, the the employment gap in terms of the number of open cybersecurity uh, professional positions and the number of professionals available to fill them and that that I think speaks a little bit to the idea that you can have an IT professional who focuses on sort of your operational IT but there's that's not necessarily the same thing as an IT professional that focuses on security management and incident response well and a lot of companies just don't have the work to pay for something yeah, um, yeah. and that's that's kind of where an organization like mine steps in uh, and we work with a lot of small and medium-sized businesses that that have a lot of risk but only like 100 to 200 employees and two or three IT people. They, they have a real need for information security. They just don't have the workload to keep someone busy enough to pay for them. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we're gonna just jump to our very last question right here. Um, I'll answer this one, spoiler alert, you probably should have cyber insurance. Not probably, you should. Um, but well, frankly <laughs> speaking, it's not, when compared to your risks, yeah. it's not an expensive expense. Um, you probably already have other insurance. That's um, significantly more costly than this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Chris, in a few words, talk to us about how how do you align information security goals with the business's goals? Well, I think I think it falls back to that triad we started the conversation off with. Think about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data and services. What's important to your business? So, so it isn't one isn't one doesn't exist without the other. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have an understanding of of how your business works your technical environment, and, and then, then you can start making those decisions. And, and you don't necessarily, so information security isn't just a skill set, it's primarily a mindset. So if you have that CIA triad going in your head while you're making a decision, should I be spending money on this thing, um, it, it'll inform all of that. Uh, a good example is if I've got a, if, if availability is hugely important to me, it makes sense for me to spend money on my servers so that they're highly available, the fail over to each other. I've got very robust backups. Um, so it's not just information security, um, it, it's having a good understanding of how your business works and it's all tied together. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Well, we will get into that more in some of our upcoming webinars right here. Um, we'll send the invitations out for these shortly here, but we're gonna be having a webinar specifically on incident response planning, what you need and what you don't. Uh, we'll talk about more about what's going on, uh, tales from the trenches, the latest cyber attacks and how to avoid them. And then lastly, cybersecurity, what works and what doesn't. Um, further details will be sent out on all these coming up soon right here. Um, but we very much appreciate you taking your time with us today here. Our contact information is up on the screen. Um, Cassie, why don't you close us out here? Yeah, we just want to thank you guys so much for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, please fill out that short survey sent to you as your feedback is very important to us. And again, remember that the slides will be given to you as a PDF and the copy of the webinar recording will also be emailed to you as well. Our next webinar will be on July 18th, how to develop open enrollment communications like a marketing pro. You can sign up on our upcoming webinars on the Hasman Johnson website. Again, thank you for joining.